So here we go. Diane. Great. It's Thank my you. My pleasure. Thank you so, Thank you. so much. Okay, let me bring up, <clears throat> let me bring up my uh, presentation here. And okay, great. So thank you, thank you so much. And just my little commercial about the League of Women Voters, as you many of you may know, we are 100 plus years old and we are a nonpartisan organization whose mission is civic engagement and voter education. We also advocate and lobby for issues that affect all New Yorkers, such as election reform, gender equity, and criminal justice reform. This presentation is based on a book, What Makes New York City Run, written by a longtime League member, Adrian Kivelson, who clearly explained the New York City Charter in all its complexity in ways we can understand. You can purchase the book on Amazon as an ebook. So to get started, the first thing we need to do is we need to just sort of center our thinking around what's happening in New York City. This upcoming election, as Carol was saying, this is a totally local election. Everything about it is local. So when you think about your concerns in New York City, think local right now, right here. You know, what are your concerns? You know, think about housing, policing, transportation, garbage pickup, playgrounds, you name it. All of these issues are super hyper local. So the bottom line is how can we, how can we as voters affect change? And of course, it all comes down to power. Who has the power? Well, we get to elect candidates to office based upon their ability to do the job as described in the city charter. So that's where we're going this evening. In this presentation, we're gonna focus on the power and the limitations of power in the five elected city positions as outlined in the city charter and also we'll spend a little bit of time talking about the elected borough district attorneys. We're going to examine their individual unique toolboxes and also reflect on our power as voters and how all this affects our lives, how significant local elections really are. And we're going to come to understand the roles and responsibilities of these elected officials so we can be informed and effective voters. Remember, in times of surplus or in times of budget cut, it is the city officials who determine how money is either saved or spent. So let's start our conversation with the citywide elected officials. These three officials, the mayor, the comptroller, and the public advocate, are going to appear on everybody's ballot across the entire city. So let's start here and talk about their power. Let's start with the mayor. The mayor in the city charter actually has really kind of a disproportionate amount of power. The city charter really is mayoral heavy, if you will. The mayor actually, in terms of the mayor's role, appoints the heads of almost every single agency, including the commissioners of health, fire, police, sanitation, and the mayor approves or vetoes any bill that's passed by the city council. The mayor proposes a budget every single year for the city, and he, ha he or she has to present that budget to the city council every spring. The mayor develops a long-term strategic plan that will help the city develop in a good way, we hope. The mayor can also create an agency 
to do work that's not being done by an existing agency. And the mayor also has the power to abolish an agency that's not needed anymore. So let's look at a specific example of something the mayor does. So in the area of strategic planning, for example, in 2014, Mayor de Blasio launched Housing New York. And this was a five borough, 10 year plan to create and preserve at least probably more, 200,000 high quality affordable homes over a 10 year period. So this is something a mayor is responsible for doing. They have to create a long-term plan and they have to obviously publicize what they're doing. So that's an example. Let's take a look at the controller. The power of the controller is audit power. There have been put into place really strong constraints in the city charter to avoid the pitfalls of what happened in the 1970s and 80s when New York City almost went bankrupt. The controller is an elected position in order to keep the controller independent of the mayor and the city council. So you want them to be totally independent of each other. You would not want the controller to be appointed by the mayor because then there's no independence there for this power they have to audit. The controller advises the mayor and the city council on the financial conditions of the city. The controller recommends fiscal policies and financial transactions that will benefit the city. The controller audits and investigates all matters related to and affecting city finances. So you see the theme here, right? It's all about the money. The controller is the caretaker of the city's money and vigilantly watches for any sign of corruption. The controller must audit and report to the mayor and the city council every year by March 1. And the process must be transparent. Therefore, there is a fabulous website for all of us to use that's called checkbooknyc.gov. And I'm gonna take you to it right now so you can see it. So this is, and you can access this, this is checkbooknyc.org. Dot gov, sorry, dot gov. And this is literally as if you were looking into the New York City checkbook as handled by the comptroller. So you can click on payroll, for example, and it will take you to payroll spending in New York City up to date. You can click on budget, for example, and it will take you, here we go, to the expense budget of New York City right now. So this is actually a pretty cool way for the city government to really be transparent to us when we know about it. And I highly recommend that you check this out, you know, and, and go to it. The other thing the Comptroller does, and this is an example of the work they do because they're constantly auditing and reporting. This is an example of a, um, a watch list that our present controller, Stringer, has put together. And it's a watch list of what's happening right now with homeless services agencies. And this is what you call really paying attention. If you notice, spending has really significantly increased. And yet, services have pretty much flatlined. So this is an example of the kind of thing that the controller is constantly watching for. Is our spending in areas such as this congruent with the services that are being provided? And that's something that the controller is responsible for. The next role is the role of public advocate. Now the public advocate's power is actually subpoena power. And public advocate also, interestingly, is the first in line of succession if the mayor can no longer do the job. So the public advocate would then be appointed as acting mayor until a special election could be held. 
the public advocate, if you want to think of the public advocate as sort of the eyes, ears, and mouth for all New Yorkers, the public advocate literally advocates for the public by monitoring, investigating, and responding to all citizen complaints. The public advocate monitors public information and complaints from New Yorkers from all over the city. The public advocate investigates and attempts to resolve the complaints and looks for patterns of complaints that are coming in from across the city. The public advocate may hold public hearings on the performance of city agencies to be sure they're providing the promised services and are complying with the law. The public advocate does not have a vote in the city council, but may introduce legislation to the city council. And the public advocate must report to the city council every year what they've been up to. The public advocate also chairs the Commission on Public Information and Communication and appoints one member of the City Planning Commission. An example of something the public advocate has been doing recently, our public advocate, Williams, has been creating this watch list of landlords in New York City. And I wanna take you to this site because this is very interesting. This is actually a, a map of the city. As soon as it comes up, you'll see, come on list, there it is. And if you hover over any of these dots, it will show you, there it is, the landlord, the address, the number of units, and the number of violations. And you can do that for any of these little dots all across the city. So this has been a powerful tool for people to use to really document any abuses by landlords in the city. So these three, these three officials, the mayor, the comptroller, and the public advocate are citywide. Let's take a look now at our borough-wide elected officials. Now, interestingly, you know, when you think about your ballot, when you go to vote, we are represented from where we live, which is why it's really important for everybody to really get the word out that you can only vote at the poll site where you're represented. I work as a poll worker also. I don't know if any of you folks work as a poll worker, but I'm an info, oh good, Joanne is. I'm an information clerk. So I'm the one who sits at the table, you know, outside where you go in to vote. And I cannot tell you how many times people have come up to my table and said, um, you know, I'm here to vote. And I say, great, what's your address? And they give me an address in a totally different borough. And I say to them, well, this isn't your poll site. And they say to me, but I work right around the corner. And I'm like, yeah, but this is not where you're represented. You're represented where you live. You have to vote where you live. And so in this primary, this upcoming primary, as well as in any election, the citywide officials at the top of the ballot will be the same in every borough. But when we get to these officials, these are borough specific. So every borough is going to be electing a borough president, a certain number of city council members based on the population of the borough, and every borough will elect a district attorney. So these are the roles and responsibilities of these offices. So let's start with city council. The power of the city council is the power to pass laws. And the city council actually has two types of laws they can pass. They can pass laws to change the city charter. And we'll talk specifically about that in a minute. And then they can pass laws that have to do with anything else city. And when we talk about limitations of power, we'll talk specifically about that. So for example, if the city council wants to pass a law about speed limits in New York City, they can do that because it's city specific. 
All right. Now, the other example would be when we pass the law in the city council about ranked choice voting. That's a city law. No other municipality in New York state is presently doing ranked choice voting except New York City. So this was a city-based law. The city council approves or disapproves the budget that is proposed by the mayor. It approves or disapproves city planning commissions, land use decisions in zoning, housing, urban renewal projects or plans, and the city council investigates any matter related to property or governance, including participation of minority and women-owned businesses in the city procurement, pro procurement process. They have to approve agency heads, such as the Board of Elections head, the Board of Health, and the Tax Commission and they have to assist their constituents as they navigate social services and city agencies. Most importantly, the other thing that city council has that we all need to be tuned into and really asking this question of our city council members is city council members should be participating in the participatory budgeting plan. In this plan, all city council members get up to, or actually more than a million dollars out of their budget for communities in their district to select capital projects for funding. So for example, a capital project might be including a park in the community or adding on services to a library or a school or public housing or community spaces. All of this, these are all capital projects that can be funded through participatory budgeting. The way it works is the entire community is invited to participate in meetings with the city council member, and then the entire community gets to vote on the proposal to be funded. So make sure you ask your city council person, are you participating in participatory budgeting? And it's really an opportunity for that grassroots participation that all of us activists really crave. Another specific example of something that city council has been able to pass is uh, various environmental laws. And we'll talk about one of the other laws in a minute, but for example, in May of 2019, the city council passed a law requiring that roofs of certain buildings be green or have solar cells on them. So that would be an example of the kind of law that they can pass that's just city-based. Let's turn our attention to the borough president. The power of the borough president is not really financial, but the power of the borough president is in delivery of services. They function the same way that um, county executives in other New York counties function. They're sort of like the CEO of the county. The borough presidents must be consulted by the mayor and the city council on any budget expenditures for their borough. They may propose legislation and budgetary expenditures for their borough to the city council and the mayor, so it goes both ways. They get to allocate discretionary spending for their borough. They review all land use decisions that affect their borough. They coordinate all citizen complaints and they chair a board of council members and community board members in their borough. And more about that in a second. They also get to appoint one member of the Department of Ed and the City Planning Commission. Now, I want to step back for a minute and talk about community boards. Now, community boards are not elected, but they are, again, a very powerful grassroots organ group that we need to be paying close attention to. In the city, there are 59 community boards. Now, interestingly, the community board districts do, no, do not align with city council districts because when everything gets redistricted every 10 years, 
they have not done redistricting of community board lines for decades. So the lines are the same, but the city council lines have changed. So the community boards now overlap into several different um, city council districts. So the city council person who represents a portion of a community board gets to recommend up to 50% of a community board that will be appointed by the borough president. And anybody who lives in the district can apply to be a member of the community board. It's, it's a, voluntary or a voluntary group. So you could go online to your borough president and fill in the application to become a community board member. And again, this is very, very grassroots. And it's our first line of defense, really our first line of defense. What the community board gets to do is actually very powerful. They are advisory. They are advisory. Each community board represents about 250,000 people. Now you think about that, that's the size of a lot of other towns in New York. They recommend projects, programs, and activities to prioritize. So for example, they might decide that they want more bike lanes or they want pothole repair or they want more trees planted. And these are the kinds of things that they would advise the city council and the borough presidents to advocate for. And because they represent 250,000 voters, 250,000 people, that's a pretty powerful lever. So you can fill out an application application to become a community board member. Another example of something that community board, I'm sorry, that borough presidents do, oh, let me go back. In uh, this, actually last month in March, the Brooklyn borough president called upon the New York City Department of Housing to disclose how many empty apartments we have right now so that people who really need an apartment can quickly get occupancy of those apartments. So that's something else that the borough president can do. Okay, so we've talked about the borough-wide executive and legislative positions, borough president, um, city council, and, um, you know, and uh, blah, 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 where was I? Um, and city council and borough president. And then, and of course the community board, which is not elected, but appointed. So now let's turn our attention to the district attorney, which is neither legislative or executive. They are the judicial branch, but um, they are elected. They are elected. Now, because they're in the judicial branch, they do not, they are not going to be part of ranked choice voting, which is interesting, but they're not. They are going to be the traditional primary um, election. The district attorney's power is that they do not have to wait for local police departments to investigate a crime. Their power actually supersedes that of the New York City Commissioner of Police. They can pursue a case or a situation without police um, initiating that work. Traditionally, what we see is that they're working in areas of criminal justice reform, community partnerships, construction and development job site safety issues, and issues of sexual violence. They are elected, but then they hire their entire staff of assistant district attorneys, okay? So that takes us through all of the powers of our electives. So now let's turn our attention to the limitations of power. How is this power limited? Well, the first limitation of power, obviously, is term limits. All of these elected officials, with the exception of the DA, the DA has no term limit. All the other elected officials have a term limit of two terms. Each term is four years and they can serve two terms, except this year, 
This year, because we just had the 2020 census and we're going to be in a redistricting phase, the city council will only be elected for a two year term. At the end of the two years, the redistricting will be complete and those city council members will get to run for an additional two years. Although it may very well be different lines of their district. Then after that, they can run for a four year term, which will give them their term limit of eight years. So the power, the restriction of power in term limits is a very, very powerful one and very important. The federal government also limits the power of the city. And this is mostly in the form of federal law and mandates. So we all know mandates are sort of like money with strings, right? So you get allocated a certain amount of money from the federal government, but it comes with a mandate. For example, let's take education. You might have a federal mandate that says that you can purchase specific equipment or materials for special education programs or special education students. That is the only thing you're allowed to spend that money on. You can't take that money from the federal government and use it for you know, hiring more teachers or you know, buying computers or anything like that. All of this money is very, very specifically targeted and mandated. And that goes for many programs, anything that the federal government gets involved with in social welfare, housing, any of these areas, the power of the city is very much restricted by these laws and mandates. The city's power is also restricted by the state of New York, by the New York State Constitution. In New York State, well, I should say in New York City, New York City is allowed to impose and regulate real estate tax. But if the city wants to add an additional tax onto New Yorkers, they need state permission in order to do that. And that goes for borrowing money, all of our laws, everything is restricted by state law. And I'm sure you all remember the perfect example when New York City passed the plastic bag ban. The plastic bag ban was a New York City law but New York City was not allowed to carry through on that until New York State allowed it. So that's a perfect example of, you know, the city and the state butting heads on this kind of power. Of course, we're all really familiar with um, the transit system in the city, which of course is under state control and education, housing, civil service, all of these fall under state control, state law, and city power is very much limited by that. So anything having to do with subways, trains, buses, roads, airports, that's all state law, which is, of course, why we see our mayor and our governor um, bumping heads occasionally, <laughs> to say it in a very nonpartisan sort of way. So that's another restriction on city power. Lastly, the other restriction on the power of the city are quasi-independent agencies who can make decisions without direct approval of city government. So for example, NYCHA. NYCHA operates more than 300 housing developments with 180,000 apartments occupied by well over 400,000 people in the city of New York. It is the largest public housing program in the country. NYCHA administers the federally funded housing choice voucher program that we call Section 8, which assists eligible tenants with rent subsidies for living in privately owned buildings. NYCHA operates senior and community centers within the housing developments, that's NYCHA. It's not New York City. So that's a power that's not within the control of city government. So here we are, we've talked about power. We've talked about limitations of power, but what about us? What's our power? 
And we need to talk about our power in terms of our voice. We can interact with the city government in a number of ways. Each elected official maintains their own website that we can access. We've already looked at checkbook and we've already looked at the public advocates um, watch list of landlords. There's also this fabulous site called NYC 311 that allows us in the, this is city government to check information and lodge complaints. You can actually go to 311 for everything like when is my street going to be plowed after a snowstorm and when is my trash going to be picked up to, you know, making complaints on any number of issues. You can go to the Board of Elections, which is vote.nyc, and that's going to tell you who's on your ballot, where you can vote, how to get an absentee ballot, and even once the election has happened, what the results are. It'll all be posted on vote.nyc. And of course, you have us, the League of Women Voters. We have this fabulous site called mygovnyc.org that we do jointly with CUNY, City University of New York. And this is a site called Who Represents Me? And what you can do is you go to this site, you put in your address, it will give you all of your elected officials, the border, the boundaries of the district on a map, and lots of information that you will need, you know, to be an effective voter. And of course, our website, which is, I mean, you could go this way or you could just do lwvnyc.org and see lots of programs that we're running, opportunities to get involved with us and all kinds of committees that we have going. Plus uh, right now we're running a lot of, uh, of classes on uh, redistricting and all kinds of other things. So our voice is really important and we have to be able to access these sites and stay on top of these sites so that we know what's happening in the city. So I hope you've discovered that each of these elected officials has a unique, unique place and a unique power in our city and a unique toolkit to make sure that New York City runs. And we're part of that. Voting is our path to power. We all know that. Information fuels that power. And we need to be thinking about who we can elect who will best fulfill these roles and responsibilities of their job. And as we say at the League, our job is to vote louder. So thank you all so much. And I would be happy to take any questions that you might have.